In 2007, a rough stone slab was discovered in a section of Glenwood Cemetery in Picton, set aside for families unable to afford a price of a plot. Scratched in uppercase letters on the stone are the words G. Louder, Hanged, 1884, Unjustly. The execution was shockingly bungled. Instead of a quick and possibly more humane death from a broken neck, he died by strangulation. The published accounts of the hanging confronted the community with the horror that hostility had produced. In December 1883, Peter Lazier was shot to death during a bungled robbery at a Bloomfield area farmhouse owned by Quakers Gilbert and Margaret Jones. The fateful event unfolded on Saturday, December 21st, 1883. Gilbert Jones, who farmed near the village of Bloomfield, went to the Bloomfield station that afternoon to sell part of his hop harvest, for which he received the considerable sum of $500. Towards evening, he and his wife Margaret welcomed a visitor, Peter Lazier, a relative from Belleville, who would be staying overnight. Around 10 p.m., Margaret Jones answered a knock at the kitchen door. Two armed and masked men burst in. Her frightened screams catapulted Lazier out of his guest room, and in the ensuing struggle, one of the intruders struck Lazier on the head. The bandits fled when Jones emerged from his bedroom, clutching a gun. On the way out, one of them deliberately fired at Lazier. The shot, according to the Gazette, taking effect almost instantly when he gradually sank to the floor and expired. A group of concerned neighbors, including the county constable, rushed to the Joneses' farm. It had snowed earlier, but the sky was now clear. By lantern light, the posse was able to follow two sets of footprints heading away from the house. The trail seemed to lead towards the homes of Joseph Thompson and the Louder family near West Lake, a distance of about five miles from the crime scene. The community was out for blood, and the accused, Joseph Thompson, 34, and George Louder, 23, were on trial by a jury of 12 local citizens. Belleville Police Chief Hugh McKinnon led the investigation, trying to match the crucial footprint evidence in the snow Neighbors who had set out in the night trying to track the killers left a confusing pattern of as many as 12 to 15 different boot markings. McKinnon compared the boots of the prisoners with the tracks. Tomsets matched, but Louders did not. A well-trained eye serves better than rulers and calipers, testified McKinnon. I know a few things that are not written in books. What followed was a classic case of how not to conduct an investigation. In some places the tracks were obliterated, in others the enthusiastic but unqualified posse literally trampled the evidence underfoot. However, based on these sketchy indications, Tomset and one of the louders, David, were arrested early the following morning. David's brother George was in custody by noon. The wildly held perception was that Lazier had been murdered during the bungled robbery attempt. The evidence presented in court was purely circumstantial. It focused exclusively on the footprint in the snow that allegedly matched the boots of the accused. The Joneses' testimony that the intruders were much taller than the accused men was ignored. Lead investigator McKinnon deliberately deceived Thompson's wife into thinking that her husband had confessed and had given direction for her to get the pistol. The murder weapon, however, was never found. 
the public was shaken to the core by the violent acts unleashed in their peaceful, prosperous community. And from the get-go, locals were convinced of the guilt of the accused. They demonstrated their feelings with ferocity. There were dark threats of lynching during the inquest. When the case went to trial in Picton on May 6, 1884, spectators applauded the prosecution and jeered at the defense lawyers. The judge was incensed by the unruly crowd, and on day two he carried out his threat to clear the courtroom. Thereupon, as one newspaper put it, the multitude were driven out by constables like a flock of sheep to their unspeakable disgust. It being understood that no spectator would thereafter be admitted, scores who had come many miles to witness the proceedings returned home. It was noted that although Patterson was considered to be a good judge, he failed at keeping decorum with the crowd that wanted the men convicted, as in the day, once the public had decided someone was guilty, there were a few opportunities to change minds. By midweek, the court had decided that there was no case against David Lauder. His boots did not match the tracks, and he was duly acquitted. As the trial neared its end, the community seethed with anger and anticipation. In those days, the mandatory sentence for murder was death by hanging, and people demanded that the defendants hang for their crime. The judge tried to oppress upon the jury the need to stick to the evidence, Tomset's lawyer urging the jurymen not to allow the magnetic influence of the public opinion to influence them in arriving at a correct decision according to the evidence and pointing to the danger of conviction upon circumstantial evidence. But the twelve men who would decide the prisoner's fate had been exposed throughout the trial to the partisan outbursts of the spectators, and they were almost certainly keenly aware of the mood of the town. After the trial, the jurymen would have to return to their lives within the community. They filed out at 5.05 on Saturday evening. Less than one and a half hours later, they returned with their verdict. Guilty. On May 10th, the two were convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. They maintained their innocence to the end. I never knew the fatal shot was fired, nor that man was killed, nor nothing of that murder, nor my boots never made them tracks. But the jury says I must die to pay some man's penalty. I am ready to die, but I die for something I've never done said Joseph Tomset in a letter to his mother. Louder said he knew nothing of the affair. I was not present when the man was shot, and I am not a murderer at heart. The newspaper reported the men could hear their graves being dug by the workmen in the yard beyond their cells. Joseph Tomset and George Louder would be hanged at the Picton Jail on June 10th. 1884. The two men were hanged in a newly constructed gallows. One died in five minutes. The other took 14 minutes to die. The hangman's bill was $40.00 plus six dollars and fifty cents for refreshments. Not everybody in the county was comfortable with the ugly public outburst that had marred the trial. Picton's mayor, Edward Merrill, wrote a letter to Prime Minister John A. Macdonald claiming that there is a grave doubt as to the guilt of the prisoners and that they should not have been convicted of murder. The men's spiritual advisor spearheaded a petition for commutation of their sentences, the two clergymen strongly believed that Louder, at least, had been wrongly convicted. 
But the tide of public opinion was beginning to turn, a movement that accelerated after Louder and Thompson both protesting their innocence to the end were hanged. The execution was shockingly bungled. Instead of a quick and possibly more humane death from a broken neck, both two men died by strangulation. These come from the accounts of the Lazier murder, Prince Edward County, 1884, written by Robert J. Sharp. In July 1903, the Great Pan American Touring Circus, Museum and Menagerie came to Picton, transfiguring modest Main Street for a few glorious hours. However, when the music stopped and the lights dimmed after the evening performances of July 22nd, a man lay dead from a stab wound to the heart, and another stood accused of slaying him. The dead man was Edward Yellow Johnson, a black American circus tent worker. Fellow circus employees, included one who claimed to be an eyewitness, stated that the crime had been committed by another black worker, Edward Clark, also known as Sideshow Shorty. The provincial detective, who had been keeping a close lookout for the kind of petty crime associated with circuses, now found himself faced with a killing. He soon located Clark, who was clutching a pocket knife on Main Street. Clark was arrested and charged with murder. The following day, the circus in its entire menagerie, animal and human, moved on to the next town, leaving Shorty to confront his fate alone. It seemed like an open and shut case. Two local newspapers, the Gazette and the Times, and categorically informed their readers that Clark was guilty. Excitement in the county rapidly reached a fever pitch. Crowds besieged the inquest and the police investigation, leading the prosecution when the case went to court in Picton in October was Roger Conger Clute. The same brilliant trial lawyer who had won the guilty verdict in the Lazier case 20 years previously. Clark, a penniless black man from the United States and could not afford a lawyer. At the last minute, the local county clerk, E.M. Young, offered to take his case pro bono. The judge and the 12-man jury were all white. The situation looked bleak for Sideshow Shorty, but in a David versus Goliath court battle, the novice Young undercut Kluke's powerful argument. He introduced an element of doubt in the jury's mind by bringing in local witnesses to suggest that this could be a case of mistaken identity. The judge believed the man was guilty. The jury did not. The crowded courtroom exploded into cheers when the foreman returned the verdict. Not guilty. In an article entitled Spectacular Justice, The Circus on Trial and the Trial as Circus, picked in 1903, Carolyn Strange and Tina Liu analyzed the complex extra-legal factors that played into this astonishing result. The Prince Edward County of 1903 was not the county of 1884. The bottom had fallen out of the hops and barley markets, in the area was trying to uh, reinvent itself as a tourist retreat. It would not enhance these efforts if Picton were to become center stage for another hanging, and the townsfolk were leery of becoming too closely associated with the killing of one alien by another, an event which, in their opinion, had by sheerest coincidence taken place in their town. Also, crucially, people were still haunted by memories of the possible wrongful conviction and the bungled execution in 1884. Clute, one of the main players back then, had become irretrievably tainted in the public consciousness and conscience. And so, according to Strange and Lou, this poor black man escaped the gallows, not because he was innocent, but because a lowly county clerk had worked on the sympathies of the jury that was dead set against capital punishment. 
Can a community feel guilt? Have second thoughts? The death penalty is now gone, abolished by the Canadian government in 1976. But this poignant epitaph should forever stand as a reminder of the perilous power of public opinion, especially during that dark period in Canadian history when a guilty verdict meant a sentence of death.